Why do I like to talk about Lucrezia Borgia? Lucrezia Borgia, Lucrezia Borgia. Why do I love Renaissance so much? Because it's such an interesting period of time. We are at the end of the 15th century and there is a general rediscovery of everything that is classical. Through digging, they find a lot of lost art. And at the same time, they start rereading all classical texts. This kind of seeps in everyday life. Because, you know, when you find nice, beautiful things, you want to make nice, beautiful things as well. For example, we have Botticelli, who paints a lot of goddesses and gods running naked through the woods. Also, there is kind of a shift from the medieval thinking. If before you concentrated more of doing the right thing under the watchful eye of God, now it was more about the cleverness of the human being. It was very celebrated. And it didn't matter what you did to reach your goals. Famous Machiavelli, if you know what I mean. And that's why we have a lot of artists celebrated in this period, in Italy and in Europe. Because, you know, you could then show off to your friends. That's why we remember Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, all these people. On the other hand, though, this way of thinking brings a lot of violence. Because, you know, if it matters more that you reach your goals instead of how you reach them, it makes an easy excuse for any kind of behavior. We have brother killing brothers, whatever you can think of. You have to imagine that at this time, if you went to a city, a town or wherever, there was no police. So you could be robbed, beaten, kidnapped, violated in any way, and you couldn't do anything. There wasn't any service that could help you. So that's why it becomes really, really important that you have a family or anyway, a social structure around you that can help you in any moment. And if you were rich, of course, even better, because then you could employ some guards, you know, to safeguard you. It didn't always help that much, because if you found someone that wanted you dead and had more guards than you, was richer, there was anything you could really do. As we will see, this interesting contrast is what brought me to read more and more about Renaissance. And a figure that really stuck with me is Lucrezia Borgia. That's why I think she's really a good example of what a woman could and couldn't be in this time. Lucrezia was the son of Cardinal Rodrigo Borgia, a guy that came from Spain and made his way up in Rome quite quickly. He became very powerful in the Vatican. They even said that he kind of helped the old Pope to get on his throne. And at the same time, he was a man that quite enjoyed life. He had many mistresses, but the one that stuck longer with him was a certain Vanozza. She was with him for 15 years. I mean, 15 years, that's quite a long time in any historic period. And they had four children together. Lucrezia and Geoffrey were even legitimized. And you think, is that even possible? I mean, a cardinal having children? No one really cared. So Lucrezia has quite an unusual family already from the start. Her mother, marries twice. Of course, she couldn't have children, you know, without having a husband that wouldn't really sit right. So Rodrigo said, no worries, I'll find you a husband. And when the first time he found her even another one, that was an academic man called Carlo Catane. And what I find really lovely is that he really grew fond of Lucrezia, who was a bright little girl and enjoyed teaching her. You have to imagine already that it's quite an open family. It's not something we are used to. There is a lot of people involved in the bringing up of these children because Lucrezia has a lot of siblings, also half siblings, because another thing that is quite interesting at this time, legitimate and illegitimate children lived all together. You have to think that a lot of the duke and princes that governed during this period were all illegitimate. If you had the power and you were kind of related to someone important, it was fine. So Lucrezia grows up in a very loving environment and when she is seven years old, she is sent to live with his father, cousin Adriana, which is another formidable woman of this time. She is called the Grey Eminence because she was so able to entertain all these important guests, ambassadors or 
well as you can imagine, that she knew all the important people. And that's what she wanted to teach to Lucrezia. You have to know that in Europe, the Italian ladies were the ones that were more accomplished in the sense that they had a very complete education. It's quite interesting and that I find really fascinating that for an Italian woman, it was important to be able to speak. They were expected to know about religion, about classics, and they were also expected to be witty, which is quite strange if you think. Still reading a novel from the 19th century, a woman is supposed to not talk too much and especially not to talk up to men. In the Renaissance, it was demanded by a gentlewoman to be able to talk back, in a witty and funny way, of course. Lucrezia learned a lot of languages, was an excellent dancer, and she could also horse ride and swim. But all this education, what that did she really need it for? Women at that time could still only marry and produce children. But as I said before, it was also expecting from them to be able to run a home that could be also a palace and a city if you were, in the case of Lucrezia, a very eminent gentlewoman, and also to be able to entertain the most noble of guests. And because of that, you were almost expected to be an academic yourself. When Lucrezia turns 13 years old, you have to imagine a young, slim girl, she has already been engaged twice. Twice the engagement is pulled off. That's why Cardinal Rodrigo Borgia has become, in the meantime, Pope Alexander VI. So he had a lot of interest in the politics. His dream was to create a united Italy under the Pope. We will find it strange, but it's not because Rodrigo Borgia, or Pope Alexander VI, was really the last Pope to kind of have these big dreams. After him, there will be a downfall of the Vatican as a secular power. We will have to reform Martin Luther and all of that. So you have to imagine that Pope Rodrigo Borgia, Pope Alexander VI, was in his full glory and he could do whatever he wanted, more or less, if he could manage all his neighbour states, which were the Spanish at the south and Venice and the German Emperor at the north, with France always eyeing Italy, because, you know, it was quite the rich price. For this reason, Lucrezia's ma marriage was quite important because, you know, she was really a pawn in these chess games of politics. But I wonder, what did Lucrezia think? You know, she was 13 years old. I mean, I know she grew up thinking that the aim of her life was to marry. And all her best friends, one was Maddalena de' Medici, who married another nephew of the Pope, or Giulia Farnese, who married a cousin of Lucrezia, had all been married off quite young in very unhappy marriages. So, you know, Lucrezia didn't expect much. At that time, in the nobility and all the high level of society, really marriage was a political move. And it was also quite easy to annul or to separate from your husband or wife. It happened more often than we can imagine or that we suppose looking back at the past. Finally, they decided for a husband for Lucrezia. The winner is Giovanni Sforza. is another illegitimate child, relative of the Duke of Milan and Pope Alexander VI. Great. If we make friends with Milan, it means that France is blocked out from Italy. So Lucrezia, please go and marry Giovanni. Lucrezia, I'm sure, wasn't really thrilled. Giovanni was 26 years old, so double her age. He was described also as quite violent and rough. Nothing really exciting. Giovanni was also not really happy to get into this marriage. He already had been married and his first wife died in childbirth. He didn't really like 13 years old and he was quite afraid of the Borgias because he felt him a trap. And so it was because usually at the time the wife moved away from her family home to go into her husband's home. But Lucrezia, being of such a powerful family like the Borgias, stayed in Rome and it was Giovanni that came to her. He would come back again to the idea that family and having a structure of relatives and friends around you was very important and the more powerful your family, the more power you had yourself. That's why Lucrezia was able to live in Rome, not very far from her father, in a palace that he bought for her. With her new husband, for three years they were married 
but something changed and it was again something in the political game. In this case, the Duke of Milan, Ludovico il Moro, decided he didn't want to stop the French to invade. He wanted actually to help them. So he threw open his door and said, come in, which of course the Pope didn't like very much and decided to start the annulment for Lucrezia's marriage. But poor Lucrezia, I mean, she hadn't decided to marry this guy and then they decided for her again that she should unmarry him, declarating that she was still a virgine intacta, which meant that she didn't have had any sexual intercourse with him. <gasps> Giovanni, as you can imagine, was furious, really scared. He risked to be murdered. It was Lucrezia herself that helped him, warned him and aided him in escaping Rome. So she found him a bit ungrateful when, with not really a lot of fault, he accepted the annulment. We can understand a bit poor Giovanni. He wasn't, as we said, a really courageous person. To make the annulment valid, he had to declare he was impotent. Impotent? You know what I mean. Which, of course, wasn't what he would have done. But at the end, he signed the papers. And here we have the first really ungrateful thing that happens to Lucrezia. Because, as we said, Lucrezia really helped Giovanni. But Giovanni was really angry with her family for putting him in this very miserable situation. He spread the rumors that Lucrezia was sleeping with her father and her brother Cesare. He then took back what he said, but of course when a rumor is afoot we know it all, it's very difficult to cancel it forever. So we have the first slur against Lucrezia. <laughs> to escape all of that, Lucrezia went to a convent, convent of San Sisto, where she had had her religious upbringing. I find it quite interesting that she found the courage to defy her family, because first her father and then her brother went with armed men to try and take her back to Rome. But she didn't. It was her way of showing her disagreement. She didn't have any other power. And I find it interesting that what she had, though, she used. She was very brave because her father was the Pope, which was practically the king of Rome, and he had all the power. And plus, he was also a father that she actually loved. While she's in the convent, a few other interesting facts happen. You know when I told you that they didn't mind killing their own brothers? We have the first example, because we have lovely Cesare, Lucrezia's older brother, deciding to kill their younger brother, Juan. Juan was not really loved by anyone except by his father. He did all kinds of things. I, I won't even start. Anyway, he was found dead in the Tevere, in the, you know, the river that passes through Rome. The Pope was out of his mind. He was his favorite son. And after a few weeks, he kind of stopped all the investigation. Probably he found out who the killer was. You can imagine when he discovered that he was his other son. Cesare. What a family. So that's the first thing that happens while Lucrezia is in the convent. And then we have a big mystery regarding her. The only contact with the outside that she had was through a messenger from her father, a certain Perotto, a nobody really. But apparently he seduced Lucrezia, or Lucrezia seduced him, we don't know and she got pregnant. After that, Perotto and one of the lady-in-waiting of Lucrezia, Pentesilea, were both fined murdered, again in the Tevere. I wouldn't drink that water. That, of course, made everyone suppose that he got murdered because he got Lucrezia pregnant. Rumors say that her son is a certain Giovanni Borgia that was recognized first from Cesare and then from the same Pope, Alexander VI. So why is everyone suspecting Lucrezia? I mean, she showed already that she was quite clever and that she had a head on her shoulders. I don't know if you say that in English. La testa sulle spalle. Which meant that she had a lot of sense. Why would she get pregnant by a nobody? I mean, the only reason I could kind of think of in her shoes is that she would do it to spite her family, you know. But that wouldn't make much sense because Giovanni Borgia wasn't really ever cared for by Lucrezia. I mean, she took him in later years when she was Duchess of Ferrara at her home, but not for long. 
while she really, really cared for another child that remained behind when she left Rome, which was Rodrigo, she really loved and looked after him from afar. Why this difference between two children? The only explanation I can give myself is that the first one wasn't her own child. Another reason that makes me think that Lucrezia didn't have a baby from Perotto is that her new marriage was very quickly arranged. I like to think that they would have waited a bit longer if she actually just had a baby. Luckily for her, the new bridegroom was very loving and charming. His name was Alonso d'Aragona. The d'Aragona were the family ruling in the south of Italy, in Neapol, and they kind of promised a bride as well for Cesare. So this new marriage was pleasing everyone and for Lucrezia started a time of happiness and peacefulness. Of course, this couldn't last. There was a shift in the political game. Cesare got really offended because the Daragona decided not to give him a bride. So he turned to France and his new friend, Louis XII, was also looking for an annulment from his previous marriage and he needed to make friends with the Pope. What better way than offering a bride for his son? France, though, had an idea to invade Italy, and that was not good for the D'Aragona, traditional enemies of the French crown. So Alonso decided to kind of run away for a while from Rome. Lucrezia would have really wanted to go with him, of course, but the Pope decided it was better she went to Spoleto. I think the Pope was already listening a bit too much to Cesare, that was telling him that Alonso was not to be trusted. So separating him from Lucrezia was the best. Lucrezia is almost 20 now, and she shows herself a capable and efficient ruler. Her first son, Rodrigo, is born, and she is reunited with her husband. You would think, happy times again. Cesare started his conquest with the help of his new pal, the French king, of the centre of Italy, and he was very feared because, like this, he conquered it all. For Alonso, the situation was really hot, and he was in a very dangerous position. So here it happens one thing that for me is still incredible, because one night Alonso is attacked and heavily injured. And of course, where did the rescue bring him? To the Pope. As I told you, there is no police at this time. So you had to rely on your own protection. The Pope is probably the richest or anyway, the most powerful man in Rome. And if this most powerful man in Rome wants you dead and you go and stay at his own house, it's probably your doom. And so unfortunately it was. But what really concerned me here is that Lucrezia and Sancha, her sister-in-law and sister of Alonso, stayed day and night to nurse him and protect him. But it wasn't enough. And at, at the end, he was strangled in his own bed, still at the Vatican, of course. It's an indication that Lucrezia's power really lied with her family. She couldn't do anything without them. What she did was, though, going into a deep, deep mourning. She was heartbroken and she showed it to everyone. That's kind of a rebellion, if you think, because she openly declares that she is against her family. And that's how she shows her disagreement, her own strength. The Pope was really annoyed with her because seeing her was like a reminder to himself of what he did. So he kind of sent her away. It's outrageous if you think that Cesare and the Pope Alexander VI immediately went to look for another husband for her. They really didn't care about her well-being. But this time Lucrezia accepted right away. I think it was for her an escape, a way out from her family and from Rome, which now held so many sad memories. Cesare, of course, looked only at himself and chose another family that would help him in his conquest, which was the Estensi. They ruled in Ferrara, at the border of Cesare's reign. So it was very important to him to have them as ally. Their family, though, was not really enthusiastic about Lucrezia. You know, she's been slurred so many times. And plus, she has this lovely, affectionate family around her. They were not sure they wanted her as a daughter-in-law. But you know what won them over at the end? Or at least won over the Duke? Money! 
Lucrezia's dowry was fabulous. I mean, money that you cannot even imagine. Despite that, they were still not 100% sure. It tells a lot that no one ever found anything against Lucrezia herself. Of course, no one really liked the Pope or her brother Cesare, but she was without blame. And I think her behaviour, when her two marriages ended, showed that she was different from her own family. And clever woman as she was, she also decided to take the part of Ferrara during the arrangement of her dowry and all the little details of these contracts called marriage. One thing that was actually against her, but you know, that showed that the Borgia really wanted this marriage, was that in case of a separation, all the dowry would stay in Ferrara, which was not what usually happened, because if there was a separation, the woman got back all her dowry. Anyway, after long discussions, Lucrezia finally departs and leaves Rome forever. I can imagine that the journey to Ferrara was full of emotional heaviness. She left her behind, her beloved son Rodrigo. She couldn't, you know, bring to her new husband, her old husband's son. It was not a good thing to do. The Duke's heir and the third husband of Lucrezia was also called Alfonso. And he was so kind of worried and excited to see his new bride that he took Rhoda ahead to meet her before she arrived in Ferrara. It's a similar story of what Henry VIII did many years later when he went to meet Anne of Cleves. And that was exactly what happened here with Lucrezia and Alfonso. But it was a success, not like the meeting of Harry and Anne, which was not a success. Arriving in Ferrara was something new for Lucrezia, because as we have seen, she always stayed in Rome with her family, under the wing of her father, with her previous marriages. Well, this time she was actually the bride that arrived to her new home. And it was quite a different home from Rome, because Ferrara is in a quite cold and foggy place, even if it's a beautiful city. Go there and eat a lot. She had a bit of a discussion with her father-in-law at the beginning, because her allowance was not enough for her, thinking especially that she brought such a rich dowry. They arrived to a compromise. The new home of Lucrezia was an old, dirty palace, but she really made the best out of it. Also, her new husband, even if he really liked Lucrezia, was very different from her. She was what we would call an intellectual and loved having artists and writers and everybody that mattered around her. Her husband couldn't care less. He was interested in arms and warfare and everything that was needed to protect his land. I think, though, that Lucrezia showed her qualities because she was really beloved straight away. And she made Ferrara one of the first courts in Italy, not to say in all of Europe. But tragedy struck, and in 1503, Pope Alexander VI died. Lucrezia was overcome by grief, and you might wonder at it, especially before what happened. But Rodrigo, especially during her childhood, really showed himself as a really loving father. With the death of Pope Alexander, Cesare's position also grew very dangerous because he didn't have the backing again of a powerful family, in this case of his powerful father. As we discover more and more, family was everything at this time. Also, Lucrezia was in a dangerous position. She didn't have her father to back her up. So if Alfonso decided he wanted to divorce her, he could. And he could also keep all the dowry, all her money. She hadn't produced an heir at this time, so her position was really, really weak. But it shows how much Lucrezia accomplished, because no one ever thought to send her away. Cesare was not as lucky, because he was imprisoned by the new Pope, Giulio II, and sent to Spain. Also, in this case, Lucrezia shows her loving nature and also her forgiving nature. Her brother murdered their brother and her husband, but she still tried to free him. And she found a new friend in her brother-in-law, Francesco Gonzaga, Marquis of Mantova. He tried to help her with all he could to free Cesare. And at this time in Italy, you really couldn't have a moment of peace, because the new pope was like a warlord and decided to kind of conquer everything that Cesare conquered before him. So Ferrara was in danger again. 
It's a very complicated war. There is a lot of shifting alliances, uh, friends, allies becoming enemies and all of that. But let's concentrate on Lucrezia. At this point she has two children. So the heir and the succession of Ferrara are safe. And in this very costly and very dangerous war for Ferrara itself, Lucrezia shows all her qualities and her abilities. Alfonso does the same, because you remember that we said that he was really interested in warfare. All his interest and curiosity, all his travel that he did around Europe, in this moment were really crucial in saving the city. As crucial as was Lucrezia's behaviour. For a time, Alfonso was also imprisoned by the Pope. So Lucrezia was the sole regent of Ferrara. She didn't despair, she sold all her jewellery and she kept the city together. Another interesting fact that really shows, I think, the greatness of these women was that Lucrezia got really close with her sister-in-law, Isabella Gonzaga. Isabella Gonzaga is another really interesting Renaissance character. She was born in Ferrara, so she's Isabella d'Este, and marries the Marquis of Mantova, Francesco Gonzaga. You remember the one that helped Lucrezia at a certain point to try to free Cesare. She was the opposite of Lucrezia in many ways. Also beautiful and very clever, she liked her to show off. And not being as rich, it was some kind of frustration for her. Also, she liked power and she had a very sharp political mind. Lucrezia never really cared for politics. Plus, we have to remember that Lucrezia got really close with Francesco. We can say it was a platonic affair, but still, you know, as a wife, probably Isabella was a bit annoyed. Despite all these differences, though, in this war, the two women really collaborated and tried to save Ferrara. And they kind of succeeded. All their secret arrangements were crucial to save the city. I find it really amazing and touching. All through this difficult time, Lucrezia and Alfonso grew closer. They really respected and esteemed each other now. But of course, there is no end to tragedy. And it's during this time that Lucrezia loses her first son, Rodrigo. She shows all her strength in not succumbing to his death. And again, I find it really strange to think that Giovanni Borgia was also her son. Because at this time he was brought to Ferrara, but Lucrezia never really cared for him and he was sent again to Rome. While she tried from afar to really look after Rodrigo and really mourn his death. After the war is concluded and Ferrara is now safe, there is a new Pope, Leone X, Lucrezia can finally enjoy a time of peace. She has many children and a lot of affectionate friends. But it's in these years that her last blood brother, Geoffrey, dies, followed closely by her mother. So now Lucrezia loses all the contacts with her old life. She gets pregnant again and it's her 10th or 11th pregnancy and she doesn't have a strong health. At only 39, she dies in consequence of this very difficult pregnancy. Could she have avoided this last pregnancy, knowing the state of her health? I guess probably yes, but you know, her role as a duchess was to produce children, as we said. Her role as a woman was to produce children. Also, I think at 39, Lucrezia has seen more than most of the people had at her age. And I can believe that she was quite tired in some way. Tired. What I really like her, of her is that in this time of extreme violence, she never lost herself, what she believed and what she was. She remained a loving person till the end. And all her cleverness was used in the most effective way and in the most generous. I think she really represents the best of a Renaissance woman. She used all the cards she had to try the best and to do what she could, which sometimes was not really a lot, we know. But still, I think she represents a really strong and loving woman. If you enjoyed this video, please click like and subscribe to my new channel. Thank you very much for listening.